Welcome to the Passion in Minds course content review. Today we'll be covering the chemistry of life part two. Let's talk about the difference between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. So intramolecular forces are the attractive forces between atoms within a molecule. So the key thing to remember is A over here for atom. So it is between atoms. Uh, the second type of force that we're going to talk about is an intermolecular force. These are the attractive forces between molecules. Right. So in this uh, in this carbon dioxide diagram over here, uh, what's happening is this bond over here that is an intramolecular force which keeps it together. Uh, let's say we have some attraction between these two carbon. That is referred to as an intermolecular force. Which is, this is intra, this is inter. Okay, so intramolecular forces are very strong forces and these include ionic and covalent bonds. Intermolecular forces are weaker than intramolecular forces. So we'll talk about the three types of intermolecular forces as they have a lot of biological applications. The first type of intermolecular force that we'll discuss are known as London dispersion forces, also known as van der Waal forces. So these are the weakest type of intermolecular forces that we'll be discussing today, and they help hold nonpolar molecules such as oxygen gas, bromine gas, or other dihalogen molecules. So let's just talk about these diagrams that I've drawn here below. So averaged over time, the electron distribution in this molecule is symmetrical, as you can see over here. But what can happen is, at any given instant, the electron distribution in the molecule may be asymmetrical and that will result in a temporary dipole, inducing a complementary attractive dipole in the neighboring molecules. So you'll have some attraction over here, right? So the molecules must be close together in order for London dispersion forces to work. Dipole-dipole forces are especially prominent in polar molecules. Why? Because you have an, a permanent dipole between these polar molecules, which, are, which is the cause of the unequal sharing of electrons, as we've discussed in the first video. So dipole-dipole forces are one of the strongest intermolecular forces, but it is obviously weaker than a covalent bond, which is an intramolecular force. So the positive dipole of one molecule is attracted to the negative dipole of another, vice versa. So in this case, we have HCl. So the Cl in this case carries a partial negative charge and the hydrogen over here carries a partial positive charge. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a dipole-dipole intermolecular force over here. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the three intermolecular bonds. It occurs between a hydrogen of one molecule and a very electronegative atom of another neighboring molecule. That includes fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen. So what happens is, let's talk about this, uh, these water molecules over here. So because you have a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen, what can happen is you can have these uh, attraction patterns or you can form a crystalline lattice if it was a solid because you'll be having attraction between this you'll have attraction between this this here and this here why because this is a partial positive this is a partial negative partial positive partial negative partial positive and partial negative so these form attractions, these form attractions, these attract, and these attract. 
So let's review a little bit. So in ionic or covalent compounds, uh, these are intramolecular forces, whereas in hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and London dispersion, you have intermolecular forces. Here you can see their relative strengths and uh, specific examples. So let's talk about the properties of water. So water is required for all life on Earth, obviously. Um, but cells, when we talk about cells, cells are 70% to 95% water. So uh, this can be water from the cytosol or the cytoplasm. You also have extracellular fluid, which is also very water-based. So this is an aqueous medium that consists of dissolved proteins, nutrients, and ions that are essential for proper functioning. Now the special feature about water is that it is polar. Uh, so it is polar because of its bent shape, right? Water looks like this in its molecular form. So water molecules are also able to form hydrogen bonds between one another as we saw in the hydrogen bonding part. Uh, and that is a very special trait that we'll discuss in terms of its cohesive abilities as well as adhesion abilities. So cohesion, uh, in terms of cohesion, uh, it's all because of the hydrogen bonds. So what happens is the hydrogen bonds allows for a high surface tension and that will cause water to form these little bead-like spheres here. So cohesive forces are responsible for surface tension. So surface tension is a phenomenon that results in the tendency of a liquid surface to resist rupture when placed under tension or stress. So water molecules at the surface, so this is the air and this is the water. So at the interface over here, um, it will form hydrogen, water molecules will form hydrogen bonds with the neighboring uh, water molecules. However, because they're exposed to air on one side, they'll have fewer neighboring water molecules to bond with, and they therefore they will form stronger bonds with the neighbors that they have currently. So adhesion is the attraction of molecules of one kind for molecules of a different kind. So in this case, you have, let's say these are glass, molecules over here and obviously these would be water these would be water molecules so there's an attraction between these and that's known as adhesion so adhesion enables water to climb upwards through either thin glass tubes or the xylem in plants and that's known as capillary action so this is an upward motion against gravity, and it depends on the attraction between water molecules and, let's say, the glass walls of the tube. And it also depends on the interactions between water molecules themselves, so that's cohesion. So this structure right here is known as a meniscus, and that is the result of cohesion and adhesion working together. Specific heat is the amount of heat absorbed or lost needed for one gram of substance to change its temperature, either increase or decrease its temperature by one degree Celsius. Heat of vaporization is the quantity of heat a liquid must absorb for one gram of it to be converted from liquid to gas. Okay, so water has a high heat capacity. Why does it have a high heat capacity? Because it resists this change due to the hydrogen bonding. So it means that water has to absorb a lot of heat 
and that's why it has a high specific heat capacity and a high heat of vaporization. Why is this useful? Because in real life, what happens is that it can moderate air and land temperature easily, so temperatures won't go up drastically or down drastically, and it allows animals to thermoregulate via evaporative cooling, where it enables animals to dissipate heat by evaporating water and leaving behind cooler water on their skin, so they get a cooling effect. So water is less dense as a solid uh, compared to a liquid. And why? Because of the hydrogen bonding. So ice floats on top of water, liquid water. So water in a liquid state, as shown in this diagram over here, this is the liquid state, keeps rebounding and changing its shape, forming, uh, uh, forming and breaking intermolecular forces constantly. In a solid state, however, it has a fixed shape. It's a crystalline lattice with space in between, making it less dense. So the highest density of water occurs at 4 degrees Celsius and um, just because of the fact that ice floats on liquid water it prevents the bodies of water from freezing solid completely. This allows fish and aquatic organisms to survive in water just because ice forms from the top down rather than from the bottom up. So, why do more substances dissolve in water than any other liquid? That's the reason why is because water is a polar molecule. So, water molecules provide partial positive charges and partial negative charges. So, the partial positive because of the hydrogen, as we discussed, and the partial negative because of the oxygen. So, in this diagram below, what's happening is that you have the, an oxygen over here, uh, and that oxygen of the polar water molecule is attracted to the sodium cation over here. Um, this enables water to form hydration shells around the ion. So you see this huge shell over here, that's called a hydration shell. So this allows many solutes to be dissolved and transported within the body. So now let's talk about the solubility of substances in water. So if you have a hydrophilic substance, what happens is you're gonna have the formation of hydration shells around. So in this case, the chloride ions in the salt are attracted to the positive partial charges of the water, so the hydrogens. If you have a hydrophobic, what happens is, uh, let's say we have oil and water. As you can see, the oil and water did not mix. So nonpolar compounds are insoluble in water because nonpolar doesn't mix with polar. You don't have the unequal distribution of charges in that case, so that's why you're not going to see a mix.